CBD, cannabis, and lung cancer. You see the headlines. Now we'll talk to an expert about the latest research. I'm Diane Mulligan. And I'm Jordan Sherman. There is still so much to learn about how CBD and cannabis may help lung cancer patients. And our next guest has some interesting insights into this, our first of two podcasts on CBD and lung cancer. So when we look at patients um, specifically for lung cancer, the first thing that I think of is alleviating symptomatology because we don't think that cannabis cures particular conditions, it alleviates symptomatology. And that's the best we know now with the research that, that we have. Lung cancer is a tough topic. It's a disease that affects patients, families, friends, co-workers. But first, it's a disease that affects people. The Hope With Answers Living With Lung Cancer podcast brings you stories about people living, truly living with lung cancer. The researchers dedicated to finding new breakthrough treatments and others who are working to bring hope into the lung cancer experience. Today, we are talking with Dr. Jacqueline Bainbridge to get the latest information in the research surrounding CBD, cannabis, and lung cancer. Dr. Bainbridge is a clinical pharmacist at the Skagg School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Uh, Dr. Bainbridge, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you do? I'm happy to. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm a clinical pharmacist at the Skagg School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences uh, here on the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. So um, I specifically work with neurology patients. Um, uh, specifically, we're talking about the central nervous system, so epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, movement disorders, restless leg syndrome. Um, but then I do um, clinical research, uh, and that's part of my passion. Uh, currently, we're working on um, many uh, cannabinoid or cannabis uh, clinical trials. You know, it's so exciting when we think about the potential for um, CBD to be used to help with the opioid crisis. I know that's one of the things that really excites us, but today we're talking about lung cancer and um, let's start at the beginning. So can you tell us the basic difference between THC and CBD? I even heard that CBD can minify, minimize the euphoric effects of THC, is that right? Um, so, so we do talk about um, uh, some of that um, component, um, especially when you have unwanted um, uh, side effects, uh, potentially with THC, you can minimize some of those or decrease them uh, with CBD. Um, so when we talk about the cannabis plant, um, it's really pretty interesting because cannabis, uh, there's more than 400 compounds in the whole cannabis plant, uh, closer really to 500 um, compounds. So, and, and we know that over a hundred cannabinoids have been identified in the can cannabis plant. Now we don't know what all of those um, cannabinoids do, um, but but there is research on some of those um, particular cannabinoids. The two most abundant cannabinoids, um, and that's why we get most of the attention uh, with the two most common, which are THC or delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol um, or CBD or and CBD, which is cannabidiol. Um, so with those two um, products, that's where we have most of our um, research. We still need more research, um, but we we try and um, we try and pick the disease state or symptomatology um, of what people are trying to alleviate. If we're talking about pain, or if we're talking about spasticity, or if we're talking about sleep that leads you in one direction uh, or the other picking a cannabinoid to start with. And then oftentimes we'll add in a second cannabinoid uh, to decrease um, the effect of uh, THC. I think that's a great point. Um, we, we do have some research out there, but more research is needed. But within the, the, the bounds of the research and the things that we know, uh, Dr. Bainbridge, 
how could CBD potentially be used for lung cancer patients? So when we look at patients um, specifically for lung cancer, the first thing that I think of is alleviating symptomatology because we really think, and, um, and we don't think that cannabis cures particular conditions, it alleviates symptomatology. And that's the best we know now with the research that, that we have. And as you mentioned, um, Jordan, we definitely do need more research. So usually we're talking, um, uh, when you're talking about an effect in um, lung cancer, and I will say there's only a couple um, case reports out there. So um, definitely, I wouldn't say everyone out there go out and stop taking your current chemotherapy or immunotherapy or don't have surgery, just go on CBD. I think that is a, a bad choice. I think that this needs to be driven by uh, the clinical um, specialists, uh, oncologists in those areas, um, and the research needs to, to be there. So when you look at um, uh, CBD, uh, and I did elicit some of my um, colleagues who work in um, the oncology world. And um, there is some thought that CBD may have a potential to alter the immune environment and stimulate a response. So making it more responsive to um, a therapies uh, or um, you know, potentially more curative. But I think it needs to be more robust. And, and certainly when we're evaluating um, those clinical trials, um, we need to look at how, what the design of the trial um, was and, um, and what were their markers? What did they use as endpoints right. um, in these particular um, patients? I know in the oncology world um, and the lung cancer world, they, they don't really um, have patients uh, uh, they don't direct them away from using um, cannabis type um, products. So I would say that oncology is one of the first areas that we actually um, realized that cannabinoids could be helpful in those patients, whether we're talking about stimulating appetite or if we're talking about nausea and vomiting, um, et cetera. Uh, so I think, I think they were really the first people um, or groups of uh, practitioners that uh, freely used um, cannabis uh, to be helpful in that medical medical therapy. So I'm hopeful that those clinical trials um, uh, continue and really um, take take um, hold, uh, and we have positive results. That would be really great. You spoke earlier about there's been some hope in the area of small. Um, small cell lung cancer and CBD. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that and what lung cancer patients should know about that? Um, I think the first thing to know is um, we definitely need more of that data, but you know, those few case reports out there and their case reports um, are interesting. But what we don't know about that is um, what were they using specifically? Did the CBD also have THC in it? So was it was it both of them together that really produced the effect? Those individuals need to work with their oncologist very closely um, because we do know that there are drug interactions that we see with both CBD and THC. So really important to have that um, opinion. And hopefully uh, those people are working with a clinical pharmacist in their, um, in their clinics and they can ask uh, specific questions, um, you know, of their oncologist and their clinical pharmacist. Doctor, because this research is so fresh, um, there's going to be a lot of gray areas out there. There's going to be a lot of um, misinformation. So uh, how do you best advise people um, about where they should do their research when looking into CBD? And if they're interested, you know, do you have any resources that, that you could provide them um, that would give them some concrete information that is factual, um, that eliminates any type of uh, uncertainty into the research between CBD and lung cancer? 
Um, and I, I think that is such an important point um, because we know that so many people are getting their information from bud tenders. Um, so again, it's, be it's best to go back to your, um, your pharmacist or your um, physician for more information. Now, I would say that you can post anything on the internet literally anything. So I would recommend that patients don't go um, just, just to any site um, on the internet, especially like um, group chats, um, that sort of thing for their information. They should really tap into resources. Um, we have natural medicine databases, um, we have uh, several other resources, but it's best to be to look in their area and um, find a practitioner who works in the area of um, natural medicines or um, cannabis specifically, or even um, their pharmacist. So depending on what state they're in, um, you know, the laws are very different and their resources are very different. There are actually some dispensaries where um, there has to be a pharmacist uh, at the end, um, uh, at the, with the end product. So whether that's a review of patients' medications and why they're consuming the products, or if the pharmacist has to be physically um, present during um, counseling with a particular product, just as you would see um, in a pharmacy. So there are a handful of states that have legislation around that. What works for one person might not work for another person. And it, because it's an unregulated um, uh, condition or not condition, but unregulated um, business, uh, oftentimes what you find on the label isn't what you find in the bottle. So I'll give you an example. Um, we sent somebody into um, a grocery store and they purchased um, what they thought was a bottle of CBD. So um, from the grocery store, it was locked up, not in the pharmacy, but um, locked up behind a counter and they had to ask for somebody to give them this particular product. They took that product home and, and I would recommend people do do this, um, went to the website, put in the lot number or that batch number and pull up a certificate of analysis because that will tell you what's exactly in there. Now, dispensaries will also give you a certificate of analysis and should have a certificate of analysis with the product that, that they're um, giving um, to you. But you can go back and look and see what is in that specific product. So in the scenario that I just um, uh, highlighted, uh, basically, uh, there were 81 mil there was 81 milligrams of THC in a bottle that was clearly labeled as CBD and the person consumer thought they were buying only CBD where um, that could that could be a, a huge problem, right? right. Um, in terms of driving, in terms of drug right. testing, um, et cetera. So it's really important to go back to that certificate of analysis and see what's exactly in those products. There are also, um, uh, you can find resources um, uh, that are um, people that are in the industry um, that are really trying to make a difference and, and help consumers uh, or patients. Um, so, and there are, um, you know, one of those particular companies we work with on a regular basis. Uh, we know the CEO, um, the CEO will um, help uh, patients with, uh, whatever blend, uh, it is that they're, that they're looking for and it's purified and you know that you're going to get the same exact product time after time after time. Yeah. I think that's so important. You know, it's also interesting that, um, oncologists, especially those who are not affiliated with a research institution are, are treating all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of cancers. And so, when you ask your oncologist about CBD, he or she may or may not have the latest information on it. Just if you ask a general oncologist about lung cancer, and there've been so many advances in the past five years that sometimes it's hard to keep up. So 
My question is, what should you do if you're very interested in learning more about this and you're interested in, um, in, in potentially using CBD and you talk to your oncologist and he or she says, I, I really am not up on that. What should you do in that situation? So in that situation, I would um, recommend, again, like reaching out to, to me, to someone else that who that consults and does you know, helps patients with these types right. of questions. I would probably start with um, your pharmacist um, or practitioner and ask what they tend to use. So there's natural medicine database. Um, oftentimes um, people can access that. Sometimes they can't access that. Um, uh, but I think that's a good uh, resource. Um, and I think their pharmacist can be a really good resource in that scenario. I would stay away. I would try and stay away <laughs> from Dr. Google. Um, and especially if you're looking at chat rooms or, um, you know, this is how Jackie felt on this particular product. So this is what I think that you um, need, need to um, use. There are so many different ways um, that we can consume CBD, whether it's an edible, it could be a tincture, it could be vaping, it could be creams, topicals, what have you. Um, what's kind of the best method to um, take CBD or does it differ between um, what types of symptomology you're trying to treat? Well, I'll tell you, I'm Jordan, that's a double-edged sword. <laughs> so <laughs> from a... From from a clinician standpoint and a researcher, we want to see serum concentrations quickly because we're monitoring serum concentrations. We want to see if the patient, um, how they respond or a certain side effect, does that match up with what we're actually seeing as a serum concentration? So going to the um, site of action. So um, now obviously we're not having patients um, smoke cannabis, as we know, there's combustibles and that's really a bad health um, issue. So then there's vaporization. Vaporization um, done, provided it's done correctly, is safer than smoking. So now, if you're talking about um, creams or tinctures, tinctures uh, by definition from the pharmaceutical world will have alcohol in them that helps drive the product into the skin. There are also patches um, to get those products actually through the skin barrier. Uh, you have to use specific um, adhesives uh, on the patches. So, um, so it just depends on your on your product, but that's going to be the slowest getting into your system is a topical. Um, and, and I would be, well, when you talk about um, suppositories, that's a fast um, way uh, to get it into the body. Vaginally, you can get things into the body pretty quickly too, because there's a rich um, blood supply. Um, but creams, um, tinctures, that sort of thing, it's going to work more locally. Um, however, you can see serum concentration bumps depending on the product that you're using. Now that leaves me with edibles. Right. So edibles are a different ball of wax. So um, we know that there's a high first pass metabolism through the liver. Um, and we know that the bioavailability isn't really great when we consume oral um, products. So as an example, same product, same person, um, one in four times that you take um, a, an edible, you will have a different response. Um, and that all just has to do with um, the bioavailability and our body. So pharmacokinetically and pharmacodynamically, how we're seeing the product and how we're metabolizing um, the product. So that was a great question. And uh, consumers need to know also that, um, that the difference in how you take these products uh, will produce different effects in the body. And it, it depends, it will produce faster effects if you're um, using a combustible or an inhalation method, uh, won't last as long. Um, but if you're taking an orally consumed product, it's going to take, there's a lag time to onset. Um, and that's uh, problematic because people want, want it now. 
and um, and those effects will last longer than your um, vaporized type products or your inhalation products. Thank you to Dr. Jacqueline Bainbridge with the Skag School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Make sure you listen in to our second CBD and lung cancer podcast, where we will dig deeper into whether CBD may or may not be right for you. Make sure to subscribe to the Hope With Answers Living With Lung Cancer podcast. You'll be notified every time a new episode is available. So visit us online at lcfamerica.org where you can find more information about the latest in lung cancer research, new treatments, and more. You can also join the conversation with LCFA on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.